Hello, my name's Andy. Welcome to episode 68 of Keeping Water. This week's episode is another fact-finding video, this time about the tench. As you may be able to see, the GoPro did indeed spark into life this week, and I had a go at some underwater filming. I put it in for about two and a half hours and ended up with about 10 minutes of footage, which isn't great, but it's better than recent attempts. I have been able to learn a number of things from this though. The pond looks pretty clean, for mine anyway. The algae hasn't totally gone, but is nicely manageable. The fish look pretty healthy and the tench is starting to slow up and has begun to rest on the bottom. This is its usual behavior as temperatures drop. So all in all, all's good in the pond. I need to cut back the plants and do a full clear out before the worst of the winter, but that won't be until all the leaves have fallen and I take the net cover off. I'll be getting in the pond to do all that, which will be a bit chilly, and I'm not looking forward that much to it. What I am looking forward to, I promise to stop mentioning, but I will say, briefly, that it's getting closer. It's going to be ace, and it means great things for the pond over the next few years. My not yet decided plan for next week's video is possibly to look at water temperatures and their effect on the fish and the pond as a whole, and my approach to it. If not next week, it will be at some point over the winter. If you'd like to watch that, the new exciting things that's coming, or just to watch my niche underwater heavy videos of my slightly unfashionable pond and inhabitants, then please give some consideration to subscribing. Right, all done. Now on to the main subject of this video, Tench. Following on from looking at Rudd last week, initially to check their tolerance to salt, I thought that this week I'd do the same with Tench. No mysteries this time, I found out pretty quickly that they could tolerate salinity, but I thought it would be good to take a closer look anyway. As you may know, I have one Tench in my pond that I've had for five years or so. I did have two others, but I moved them on with the Crucian Carp to make a better mix and make room for my new fish still coming soon. Like Rudd, Tench are also a species of the Ciprinidae family, but are additionally of the subfamily Tinkini. Tench have a thick-set carp-like shape with olive green skin, darker above and almost golden below. They have a broad tail often described as being like a paintbrush. Its other fins are large and round and all are dark in colour. Its eyes are a distinctive orange-red colour. The tench has very small scales, which are deeply embedded in a thick skin, making it very slippery. They also have a small barbel by their mouths. Differences between sexes are clear, with males having a thicker and flatter outer ray to their ventral fin and prominent muscles around the ventral and anal area. Tench grow to an average of 40 to 45 centimetres in the wild, although fish of 70 centimetres and above have been found. They grow more slowly than carp, although slightly faster than rudd. Males, on average, are smaller than females. The tench in my pond has grown to 45 centimetres. Tench are native throughout most of Europe, except for Ireland, northern parts of Scandinavia and southern Europe, for example Greece. It is also a native in Asia, as far east as western Siberia. It is also present in Spain and Italy, however whether native or stocked is unclear. However, it is known to have been stocked in lots of other countries, including Ireland, Greece, America, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and China. Tench are typically found in well-vegetated lakes, canals and ponds and can tolerate less than ideal condition. They often overwinter buried into the mud and or silt at the bottom of the pond. This was a behaviour that saved my tench from dying when my pond froze in the famous beast from the east winter of 2018, but more on that later.
Once laid by the adults, eggs will incubate while attached to plants for approximately three days if at an ideal water temperature of 20 degrees. Longer, obviously, in cooler water. Larval fry hatch at about 4 to 5 millimetres and remain attached to the plants for several days until the vitalis is used up. Larval fry and juveniles keep to dense vegetation. Tench fry, like rudd, feed mainly on unicellular algae and cladocera, crustaceans under 3 millimetres long, although may move on to larger items sooner than rudd as they grow more quickly, especially in their first year. As they grow larger, tench have a predominantly carnivorous diet, including caddis and mayfly larvae, bloodworm and worms, as well as freshwater mollusks and crustaceans as they get to adulthood. Tench tend to feed mostly on the bottom or within plants. Rarely in the wild do they feed off the surface. However, in my pond they do so more regularly, although they're quick and nervous when they do it. In the wild, in favourable conditions, their growth is as follows. I got my first tench at about six inches long, when I would guess it was about two years old. Its growth since has been as follows. Which interestingly shows that its growth is slightly above average so far. It could be that it was actually three years old when I got it, but even so, its growth while in the pond has been really positive. It's been fed on the same pellets as the carp, from on the surface and the bottom of the pond. I guess that it was also fed on some of the same insect and crustacean life as the rudd, as well as some algae. But while its overall growth has been quite positive, there has been a fairly significant problem with the tench's growth that two of the three tench I've had have experienced. I did some research for a previous episode, but for newer viewers, and as it's pertinent to this video, I'm including it here too, with some updates. At the time I investigated this, I had three tench. One large one, which as you know I still have, and two smaller ones that I felt might have become a breeding pair. There was something a little unique about the two of them though. First, the largest tench, as it's grown bigger, has developed quite a pronounced hump. So instead of a smooth transition between head and then back and dorsal fin, it has a sharp rise. I was fairly confident that this wasn't normal growth and development. So, in the best traditions of research, I turned to Google. I did a quick image search and although there were some where the back raised up more than the usual smooth transition, none were really like my tench. I realised though that this was not entirely scientific, but it at least gave a base to work from and I do manage some better research later. The next tench, the male tench, has a subtler but still obvious deformity. Best revealed when viewed from the front, it shows that its head is slightly askew to its left. I'd noticed both deformities for some time, but so far neither had appeared to cause them any problems, but I was interested to look into what might have caused it, especially as two of the three tench I had had both experienced it. So I turned to Google, but this time tried to find some more relevant and proper research. A number actually came up specifically about tench and skeletal deformity, although, as was often the case, I couldn't always get access to full articles, which is a perennial problem when trying to access research. Anyway, I found a few interesting ones, especially two from Poland which looked at a lot of different factors that affect growth, including temperature, diet, environment, etc. They took a large sample size from intensively grown fish, which, while obviously different from a small pond environment, did give a lot of useful data to learn from. The study I could read the full text from yielded some interesting facts. They looked at two possible hypotheses. One, that temperature can significantly influence body chemical composition and the incidence of body deformities in fish. And two, the effects of temperature on fish depends on their diet. The fish studied were juvenile tench 
and were split into two groups. One fed natural food and the other fed dry pellets. Each group was then in turn separated into further groups and kept at 10 degrees, 23 degrees and 26 degrees. The findings were as follows. Body deformities occurred in all groups of fish fed solely or partially with a dry diet, 21.5% to 89.5%. The incidence of deformities was directly proportional to the temperature and the content of dry feed in the diet, reaching the maximum in fish fed exclusively the dry diet at 26 degrees. The conclusions they drew, therefore, were that deformities in tench were considerably higher in fish that were fed a dry pellet diet than in those fed a more natural one, and that this in turn was exacerbated by the fish living in higher temperatures. They also determined that an insufficiency of phosphorus in the diet played a major part in the incidence of deformities. Now, this was all pretty new to me, but mostly made sense. It also had relevance to my tench. Their diet was and is predominantly pellets, as they eat the same food I feed the carp. As you may know, I also regularly give bloodworms, but my guess is that the bigger carp and the faster rud get the majority of these. So does and did this explain my fish's mild deformities? Genetics may also play a part, as I'm not sure their genetic stock was that high. But with an identified connection between diet and deformities, and my fish having had received the type of diet with which deformities are more likely, it seemed a reasonable conclusion to draw. Males spawn at two to three years and females at three to seven years. Spawning happens, depending on water temperatures, between May and September. Tench tend to spawn later in the year than many fish due to them requiring sustained temperatures at or above 20 degrees. They lay numerous sticky green eggs on plants or on the bottom every one to five days for two months. Although I had a male and female mix in my pond for a couple of summers, they didn't spawn. This could have been for a variety of reasons. Firstly, my pond may not have had sustained periods of high enough temperatures. Secondly, Although my pond has a plentiful amount of plants, they may not have been suitable to meet the tench's needs. Lastly, with just three fish, there may not have been the shoal behaviour and triggers that might precipitate spawning. Tench shoal together in the wild, not in huge numbers, but enough to maintain some safety from predators. They're also often seen with other fish, particularly carp, but also bream and crucian carp, mainly as they eat similar food and all root around in the silt on the bottom. It was interesting when I had three tench in the pond. The two smaller ones would swim together and attempt to shoal up with the larger one. The larger one, however, was not that bothered. It would either do its own thing, often followed by the smaller tench, or would choose to swim with carp instead of the tench. This may have been due to the carp's size giving her a better sense of protection, or, as she'd spent more time in the pond with carp, either my original ones or current ones, she was just more used to them. As I mentioned earlier on, another famous facet of tench behaviour is their tendency to burrow and hide in silt, detritus, plants or other small spaces. This has been demonstrated to significant effect in two ways in my pond. Firstly, both the first tench and the pair I got later disappear completely after I initially introduced them. Tench can be hard to spot in a garden pond at the best of times, but even diligent work with the GoPro couldn't find them. In both cases, the tench hid for about six weeks before finally revealing themselves and then joining in with the life of the pond as if they'd always been there. My guess would be that they hid in the admittedly large and untidy folds in the liner and only came out of dark, which is their species' favourite time to feed in the wild after all. The other way was when the remaining largest tench survived the beast from the east freeze that befell the pond in 2018. If you don't know, the first iteration of my pond had more exposed pipework and a filter that was sat outside. The pond nearly survived the famously sub-zero winter spell in 2018 but with just a few days to go 
a frozen pipe and a failed joint meant water was pumped out of the pond, the level dropped, and with no water returning from the filter to agitate the surface, the surface froze down about 12 inches, and with the water less than half the depth, this meant most of the water became ice. The original carp and all the original rudd all died, but half of the rudd fry survived. The tench was the largest fish to make it, due, in no doubt, to its instinct to bury itself in any bottom detritus, which enabled it to keep in the remaining still liquid water. That it was probably already doing this helped as well, as the freeze was probably quite rapid. The tench is the first fish to stop actively looking for food as we move from autumn into winter, and the first to become increasingly sedentary as the temperatures drop. It's also the last to start actively looking for food again as we leave winter and enter spring. Right, I hope you've enjoyed this closer look at the tench. It's been quite fun to make, although not to record, because there's fireworks going off. But I think I've got there. I think they do pretty well in the garden ponds, although hard to spot and they feed throughout less of the year than the other pond fish, although their growth has been pretty good. They're confident once they settle in and they prove themselves a hardy and resourceful fish. And as I said at the start, they can also tolerate salinity and in fact live in brackish water in certain parts of the world. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Keeping Water, I really do appreciate it. As I said, next week's video may be about water temperatures, or it may be about the carp, or something completely different. The only way to be sure will be to tune in next week and take a look, and the easiest way to make sure you do that will be to subscribe. It does make sense. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.